I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, you know, I made a lot of notes. This really means a lot to me, being here, um, because I, I'm basically here for, for Viraj Sawant, who uh, helped put this whole thing together, who I met about three years ago in Brighton, a seaside town uh, south of London, where they have, among other things, a, a great music festival once a year. Uh, and that's where we met. And uh, I was very impressed with him. I'm, over the years, I've grown more and more impressed with him. And uh, I, I've done my best to, to mentor him. And uh, it's something I believe very strongly in. And uh, that's, that's what I, I'm really going to be talking most about. And uh, I'm so proud of him pulling this off in 30 days, you know, um, which is another. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I, I think it, it's, it's amazing. And he's had a rough ride these last few years. And I'm so glad to see him, you know, on, on the right track because uh, he's definitely a star of the entertainment business in, in for the future. And that's what we need. Um, so, uh, I, unlike my former partner, Richard Gadara, have I don't have a, a, a drop of talent, I, I, even in my pinky, you know. Um, it's true. Uh, what, I, what I am and what I've always been is a fan, a, a music fan. And uh, luckily, I, I became a fan very early on because uh, I have a sister who is six years older than me, and uh, we were really middle class. I mean, not rich. I mean, as uh, the, former, the gentleman who was just on before. In fact, as, uh, as Gilbert and Sullivan would say, the lower middle class, probably. We lived in a small apartment in Brooklyn, which was a really happening place then, and, and is all over again right now. Uh, the radio was always on. It was before rock and roll, and that was my first exposure to music. But when I... Uh, I was about six or seven years old. When I got a little bit older, I discovered that if I turned the dial on the radio all the way over to the right, I would get some rhythm and blues stations that played rhythm and blues, black music. People like Chuck Berry, uh, Fats Domino, who was my favorite, Little Richard, um, and the great doo-wop sounds of, of groups like the, the uh, moon glows and the flamingos, and uh, I was captured by it. Um, then uh, I was able to get a, another station in Wheeling, West Virginia, WWVA, and they played country music, and I discovered Hank Williams and, and Johnny Cash and Carl Smith and Kitty Wells and people like that. And... Uh, and then, out of nowhere, came Elvis Presley, who, to me, was a, a symbol like Joshua from the Bible. He broke down all the walls that separated pop music, rhythm and blues, gospel music, country music, and rock and roll was born. And I was there at the birth, and um, I've, been, I've been chasing it the, my whole life. Uh, and I, I tell you that if it wasn't for the mentors in my life, uh, I, I would be nothing. And it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, when I was 13, I decided I wanted to be in the music business. I knew absolutely nothing about the music business, but I listened every Saturday morning uh, to a disc jockey, Martin Block, who played the top 25 pop records, the top five R&B records, and the top five country records off the Billboard charts. So I figured that's where I've got to go, Billboard. Uh, Tom Noonan, the chart editor of, of, of Billboard, my first mentor, let me in, sat me down, and let me go through all the bound volumes of Billboard 
I went all the way back to the, to the late 30s and 40s reading about what the music business was all about. Uh, I also met the legendary music editor of Billboard, Paul Ackerman. He, in, he invited me to go to music sessions where Billboard reviewed their records, and that's where I met many of the rest of my mentors, including Ahmed Erdogan and Jerry Wexler, the powerhouses beh behind Atlantic Records, probably the greatest indie label of, of, of all time, and now part of, 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 of the Warner Music Group, for a long time part of the Warner Music Group, which is the, the company that bought my company as well many years later. I also met Sid Nathan from King Records, a little company in Cincinnati that put out nothing, really, but rhythm and blues. James Brown uh, was their biggest star. Hank Ballard, the guy who wrote and created the dance craze, The Twist. And he was my greatest mentor of all. I, I also met George Goldner, who years later I worked for at Redbird Records, along with Lieber and Stoller, the, the first great rock and roll writing team. Now, um, those, of those eight mentors of mine, uh, six of them have been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, I still pinch myself because I can't believe it. So have I. I mean, and it, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's one, it's one of the, it, it, it's one of the, the greatest honors, you know, if not the greatest honor of, 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 of my life, you know. And um, the, uh, the thing is, find yourselves, if you're on the way up and looking, you know, f find somebody, or find as many people as you can. I mean, I didn't take any chances. I covered all my bets, you know. I had eight and probably more. Uh, you know, uh, mentors, because um, you've got to learn, and it's 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 very 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 important. Uh, the other thing, you need to have the courage of your own convictions. Uh, if you believe in something, do not do not let anyone talk you out of it. Um, when uh, when I signed the Ramones. I actually was threatened by the manager of two of the biggest artists that we had on the Sire label at, at the time, a, a, guy, a guy called, um, if you remember, Copeland. No, no, that was a different time. <laughs> you, I saved your life a couple of times, too. Now, uh, but uh, Miles My, Copeland, um, we had two, two bands, the Climax Blues Band, and, and Renaissance. Actually, we gave him the Climax Blues Band to manage, and he, was, he said, if you put this junk, this punk music out, he said, I'm going to pull these artists off your label. Of course, he couldn't. We had valid contracts and everything, and uh, I told him where he could go. Um, but, um, y y you know, uh, Madonna was an artist. I, I didn't find out till much later. Nobody wanted. Um, you know, I um, very strange circumstances how I, I got to sign her. Uh, you know, everyone says this is the greatest thing you've done. It was an accident. Um, it really was. But I, I reacted properly to it. Uh, there was a disc jockey, a, a, a club DJ, who. I followed around from club to club. Mark Kamen's his name is. He's not long remembered, or you know, but it's a shame. He played the best music, and I gave him some work to do, uh, remixing and other things. He wanted to be a producer, and um, I said, "Look, you you can never become a producer with any of my artists that are signed, because they don't know you." You have to find the artist. You, ha you, you have to convince them that you are the producer and then get them signed. And I gave him some money, about $18,000, to make six demos. The third one he brought me was Madonna. I was in the hospital at the time. One song, a song called Everybody, 
I played it over and over again. It was the early days of the Walkman, the, the cassette version of it. And uh, I just, maybe it's because I was stuck crazy. I had been in the hospital for two weeks, uh, and I had another two weeks to go. It was an infection that I had. And um, I said, I want to see her right away. I don't want anybody else, you know, to get hold of this and, uh, to, you know, to sign her. And uh, I, I said, Mark, you know, I'm here another two weeks. He called me up. <laughs> this was about uh, 12 o'clock in the, in the, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He called me up at 4 o'clock. I just spoke to Madonna. We'll be there at 8 o'clock. I said, oh, no, no. I said, not today, but they came anyway. Now, I had been in the hospital for two weeks, as I said. I, I don't know the last time I had showered because I was hooked up to all this machinery, you know, uh, I was on penicillin, uh, penicillin drip, and it's not a pleasant thing. Um, I hadn't shaved. I, I had hair then, I, and I, you know, needed a, a haircut, and uh, I didn't have pajamas. I was walking around in the hospital pajamas with a slit. I don't know if they're the same in, in, uh, in, in here in India, but a slit right up the backside, and no bathrobe, and. My, my secretary arranged for my barber to come. He not only cut my hair, he actually shaved me, you know, and uh, everything I unhooked. I took a, a, a shower and, um, you know, well, she came in the room. She couldn't have cared less, you know. We became great friends, but when she came in there, she couldn't have cared less if, if I was laying in the bed inside a coffin as long as I could just sign my name. As anxious as I was to sign her, she was anxious to be signed. She would have signed with anyone, you know, and, and I, I, I just, you know, it was not my charm or anything. It was just that I, that I, I you know, I, I liked her. And you've got to seize the opportunity. And people, again, thought I was crazy, you know, and... Um, I, I'll, 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 I'll tell you. I'll tell you. An, a, a, you know, a, a, another story. If you want. If you want to. I mean, uh, another story. And there's one Virage wants me to tell, which I'll, I'll, I will also tell, which uh, is is one that got away. But um, the the Ramones. Uh, my my ex-wife. Uh, you know, loved them as much as I did. She was a school teacher. And she gave up all of that to co-manage the Ramones. And uh, as a result of that, the Ramones were in and out of my house all the time. They knew my every move. I flew back from England, and an hour later, I have Johnny Ramone on the phone. And he says, you know, it, it, you know that had that Forest Hills, Queens accent. You know, we just got some new songs we wrote. We want you to hear them, you know? So I said, look, uh, Tomorrow's my first day back. It was a Sunday. I said, tomorrow's my first day back. Let me catch up. Anytime you want to come in Tuesday, I'd love to hear what, you know, and you pick a time. He said, oh, no, we want you to hear him live, and we know that you have nothing planned for Wednesday night. Because of course, they knew from my wife. Um, and they said, so we booked ourselves into CBGB's come down. Now, um, the opening act was supposed to have been a band that I had seen and did, had no interest in signing. And I was, it was middle of November, right, November 15th, and it was, this is before global warming, but it was a beautiful, warm November night. I'm standing out there with Lenny Kay, who's Patti Smith's guitar player. I hope, I don't know if you know all these uh, American artists, but um, so, all of a sudden, I hear, when my love stands next to your love. And the music got me like, y y you know, like you see in some of those Turkish, you know, Popeye cartoons where there's somebody's playing a pipe and the music just draws you in. You know, it's so infectious. I got sucked into the room, and Lenny is following me, and I, 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 said, uh, I said, who is this? He says, Seymour, these, this is the talking heads. And I wanted to sign them right there on the spot. 
I mean, and, and that's been a case many, many times, and, and many times successfully, but not with the talking heads. It, they didn't know what they wanted to do. They were still living uh, up in Providence where they had gone to school. They didn't know what they wanted to do. Exactly 11 and a half months later, on November 1st of the following year, they signed to Sire Records. And that was, those were the most, I mean, I bit my nails down, you know, probably uh, up to here. <coughs> you know, I, because I, I love the band so much. And uh, I thought somebody else would grab them, and nobody did. And um, I never gave it a second thought. It didn't, <coughs> it didn't shatter my belief in them at all. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, I better have a little more water. And that, that's what I'm trying to get across. If you believe in something, keep believing in it, because, <coughs> you know, unless circumstances change, you know, and, and um, that's, you know, uh, a few years later, I saw a similar scene to CBGB's starting to go on in the UK. And I became friendly with the, uh, the, the main guys from the indie labels there. Jeff Travis of Rough Trade, da Daniel Miller of Mute, Martin Mills of Beggar's Banquet. And <coughs> they were, became like my A&R team. When, uh, when uh, Jeff Travis told me, I found a band that you're going to love, I flew over and saw them, and I signed the Smiths. Uh, one morning, and this is the strangest story of all, or one of the strangest, I um, I got up early. I was looking in the NME, the, the big English music uh, paper, and I saw that Daniel Miller, and I had put out two records by, by him as an artist, had signed a, a real band, and they were playing a gig, and I looked, and it was that day. And um, they're called Depeche Mode. And um, I just threw on whatever clothes I was wearing. I had a, an apartment in London by then because I was doing so much business there. And um, just ran out, had to pay full price for the Concord. And, you know, it's a, lo a lot of money. And, and went there, had people pick me up. We drove up to Basildon, which is the, the town where they, they were from and where they were performing, and signed them on the spot, you know. Um, you just have to have the courage of your own convictions, and, and it'll see you through. Now, the story the, 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 the story that uh, Viraj wanted to tell happened well before that. Uh, Richard and I were very lucky that we met a, a, a young guy um, who worked for British Decca Records, and this was towards the end of the, of the 60s, this was all before all of this, guy called Mike Vernon, and um, he wanted, he, he was producing Eric Clapton, John Mayle, who was the, 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 the most, he was the most iconic figure in British blues at the time, not the biggest seller. Mike was also producing 10 Years After in Savoy Brown, and um, he wanted to start his own label, and we helped him. And... Uh, the first band he signed were musicians that John Mayle had fired. Everyone wanted to be in John Mayle's band. In fact, Eric Clapton left the Yardbirds, who was selling millions of records, to join the Blues Breakers. I mean, usually it goes the opposite way. You leave a blues band to, to join a pop band. And um, so I helped him, and he's a great guy. You know, we're we're both still in touch with him today. He's retired and living in Spain. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm talking about Mike Vernon now. And I, I see the, 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 in the British press, the number one record, first week on the chart, 
is Fleetwood Mac. And that was the band that he put together from the three musicians, Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and Peter Green. And it was originally called Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. And, it was, and Richard and I were struggling to keep our doors open, right? We really were. And I was, we were very happy for Mike. About four weeks later, another record comes in the top ten, the British album chart, a band called Chicken Shack. And this band featured Christine Perfect, who later became Christine McVie. She married John McVie from, from Fleetwood Mac and joined Fleetwood Mac. And they had this little label out of nowhere with two brothers running the company, you know, had two albums. You know, I said, Richard, what the hell are we doing wrong? And then a few weeks later, a big story appeared in one of the American trade papers about Blue Horizon, and we called him to congratulate him. And, you know, you had a place, in those days, they were called trunk calls. You had to place him in advance, you know. And uh, he said, oh, I d we just hate running this company. He said, D D do you want to be our partners? I said, where am I going to come up with the money to be a partner? You've got two top ten albums. And he, they, would, they were more desperate for us to become their partners, you know, and, and it, it kind of it kept um, Sire alive. It kept our doors open for about three or four years during tough times. But the story that, that Viraj wants to tell is it happened with Mike Vernon and his engineer, a guy called Gus Dudgeon, who later became the main producer of, of Elton John, but at this time he was a, an engineer at DECA. And uh, I went with the two of them to the Windsor Pop and Jazz Festival, and there was a, a band there that was, that blew me away. You know, the incredible. And, oh, I gotta tell you, the, 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 the pretext. I had, I had a complex, uh, I've had many complexes, and, and, and here I am, you know, I, I, I'm just a fan. And um, so I, this incident got me over that complex, thank God. And I'll tell you how it happened. So the band are playing, and I said, this band are unbelievable. And then I see they're managed by Chris Wright and Terry Ellis. And Mike produced their band. Mike produced... Ten years after in Savoy Brown. I couldn't wait for them to finish. I said, Mike, this band, we've got to sign them for Blue Horizon. He said, oh, no. He says, I say, Ma, I work with guitarists. I can't work with flautists. I didn't know what he was talking about because we called them flute players. Gus, you know, you're the engineer here. He should produce. He says, so he turned to me. And I like Gus. You know, he, unfortunately, he, he died a, a, a horrible car crash coming home from Elton John's house at a, a party about 10 years ago. But um, so uh, I said, Gus, please talk to him. I, I said, I, I want him to sign this band. He said, Seymour, he says, you don't, you don't play a musical instrument, do you? I said, Gus, what are you, stoned? I said, what does this have to do with, with, with anything here? I said, he said, well, if you played a musical instrument, you would have heard all the mistakes, all the bad notes that this band hit. I said, listen, this is rock and roll. I said, what do you expect, you know? I mean, this is, this is not Beethoven's symphony, you know? So uh, we didn't sign them. The, 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 the band wa was Jethro Tull. Uh, and, but it has a good ending, I'll tell you. It has a, a, a well, first, it got me over my complex, you know, I mean, which is terrific. But it had a, a, a very positive ending a, 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 as well, because two years later, I found a band called Focus in Holland. And um, the, the, the main guy in the band, there was a guitar player and, and, and a flute player, and he was a classically trained flute player. A Tice Van Leer, and I, I heard the demos, and I said, Mike, 
I don't care if you like flautists or flutists or whatever. You're producing this record, and he did. And it was a million. It was it was Sire's first million-selling record. Anyway, th I I think that the, what the point I'm trying to drive home is if you believe in something, don't let and you really believe in it. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. And also, if you if if there's something you need to know and and you know find yourself a mentor or two or three or four or more, you know, and uh, and, and and that's it. That's that's my prescription for for the success I've had in the, in the business. And I've been at it for over 50 years.